Our first program, 40 years ago, was ushered in by a bright comet, Alan Rowland. And now, for our 40th anniversary, we have an even brighter comet, Hale Bop. Telescopes all around the world have been watching it. For thousands of years, man has studied the skies, but only in the last few centuries has he had any help. In this special anniversary program, I'm going to trace the development of the telescope. Now, this is my modest observatory at Celsius. The main telescope is a 15-inch reflector. That's to say, it collects its light with a mirror 15 inches across. It serves me well, and where would an astronomer be without his telescopes? So, when was the telescope invented? Recent research indicates that the first telescope may have been made in England, round about 1555, by Leonard Diggs. Well, we don't know how it looked, Patrick. They may well have made it square. What we did was just put a box around it to keep out stray light, which is what you need with a telescope. But mm. the optics are right. What we're seeing is a church spire over in the distance, and it's got um, some bands across it. These are of lighter masonry. And the magnification is about 11 times. In order to get it the right way up, instead of looking through here, you'd want this tilted up here, and then you would look, excuse me, down in this sort of fashion. And you get an upright image. The first telescope, of which we have definite knowledge, was built by a Dutchman in 1608. It was Galileo who was the first great telescopic astronomer. He heard about the Dutch invention and realized he could improve on it. So he made a telescope himself, and here it is in the Science Museum in Florence. Of course, it's nothing like so effective as modern binoculars, and none of Galileo's telescopes magnify more than 30 times. But Galileo used it to make a series of spectacular discoveries. He saw the craters of the moon, the myriad stars of the Milky Way, the satellites of Jupiter, and even something strange about the shape of Saturn, though he didn't realize it was a ring. And everything he saw confirmed his view that the Earth goes round the sun and not the other way around. Predictably, the church was impeccably hostile. Galileo was accused of heresy, brought to trial by the Inquisition, and forced into a perfectly hollow and meaningless recantation, after which he was condemned to live alone here in his villa, where he died in 1642. And amazingly, it was only in 1992 that the church finally admitted that Galileo had been right all along. How did Galileo's telescope work? Well, this is a replica, but the principle is exactly the same. It's what's known as a refractor. The light's collected by a glass lens or object glass, and the light rays are bunched up and brought to a focus. And at the focus, the image is enlarged by a second lens known as an eyepiece. But lenses do create a problem. Light is not white. It's a mixture of all the colors of the rainbow, and the different colors are bent or refracted in different ways, so that a bright object, such as a star, is surrounded by colored rings. One early remedy was to make telescopes very long. Look at this one. It must have been amazingly awkward to use. And so we come to a new type of telescope, and the incomparable Isaac Newton. Instead of using a lens to collect the light, he used a mirror, which reflects all colors equally. This is one of his first telescopes, presented to the Royal Society in 1671. The light comes from the main mirror onto a smaller, flat mirror, and thence into the side of the tube where the image is formed. In Newton's time, the first major British observatory was set up here at Greenwich, admittedly for navigational purposes. King Charles II ordered it to be built and paid for it by selling old and decayed gunpowder to the French and not quite in European Commission guidelines. The buildings were designed by Sir Christopher Wren, who was an astronomer long before he turned to architecture. The first astronomer royal was John Flamsteed. He used telescopes to draw up a very accurate star catalogue. The next was Edmund Halley, the first man to predict the return of a comet. He used this instrument to measure the movements of the moon against the stars. The next stage in telescope development was due almost entirely to one man, William Herschel. Herschel was born in Hanover, came to England as a young musician, became fascinated by astronomy, and decided to build his own telescopes here in Bath. His old home, number 19 New King Street, Bath, 
is now at the Herschel Museum. From here, in March 1781, Herschel discovered the planet we now call Uranus. This is a replica of the telescope almost certainly used on that famous occasion. Herschel's largest telescope had a mirror 49 inches in diameter, so we could look well beyond the solar system and out into deep space. Herschel wanted to find out how the stars are arranged. He believed our galaxy to be a flattened system, and in this he was right. When we look along the main thickness of the system, we see many stars almost one behind the other, and that gives the impression of the Milky Way. One problem is the telescopes at Herschel's are cumbersome. The Earth spins round from west to east, so the sky seems to go round from east to west, carrying all the celestial bodies with it. Early 19th century astronomers had one answer, mount the telescope equatorially, with a polar axis pointing toward the celestial pole, and the telescope mounted on that axis at right angles, so that only the east-west movement has to be adjusted. Oddly enough, the next great telescope, the Ross Reflector, wasn't equatorial. It was made in 1845 by the third Earl of Ross and set up at Burr Castle in the middle of Ireland. And it was like nothing else ever built either before or since. It had a 72-inch mirror and the tube was slung between massive stone walls so it could reach only a very limited area of the sky. But it was a great success. And Lord Ross used it to make the first observations of the so-called spiral nebulae that we now know to be remote galaxies. I think he had to build these great supporting walls here because it was so much bigger than any telescope had ever been before that it, it needed that support and uh, that limited its line of vision. But he managed to see enough, even if it called upon him to be that little bit more patient, to wait for what he wanted to see and draw to come into his line of vision but it certainly succeeded like that. What do you consider to be the greatest discovery made with the telescope? I would say it uh, must be the spiral nature of the furthest galaxies that could be seen from here or from anywhere else on Earth, like the famous whirlpool that he was the first to see and draw. There was a time when if you wanted to see the spirals you had to come here. No other telescope would show them. Indeed, because this was the biggest and most powerful anywhere in the world. The telescope has been restored and it's nearly ready for use again. It must have been a tremendous job to get it back into action. It has been a tremendous job and quite an expensive job, but it's been the realisation of a lifetime's dream. The 72-inch mirror was made of metal. In the 1840s, you couldn't make mirrors of that size out of glass. And there were various other problems too. For example, the movement of the telescope was never smooth enough for it to be mechanically driven. And that meant you couldn't use it for photography, even though by then photography was being developed and very good pictures of the moon were being taken by people such as Lewis Rutherford. But it wasn't until the end of the century that photography really took over from visual observation for most branches of astronomy. And by then, some astronomers were turning back to refractors, for example, the 33 inch at Myrtle outside Paris. And this was followed by one at Flagstaff in Arizona. The observatory was established in 1896 by one of astronomy's great characters, Percival Lowell, because he thought, uh, correctly, that seeing conditions here would be excellent, um, despite the weather of the present moment. He built a 24-inch refractor, mainly to study Mars, which he believed, uh, wrongly, to be covered by a network of canals. At about the same time, the 40-inch refractor was being built at Yerkes, near Chicago. It is still the largest of all refractors, and is likely to stay that way. The problem with refractors is that the lens has to be supported round its edge, and if it's too heavy, it will distort under its own weight, making it useless. The Yerkes telescope was masterminded by an American named George Ellery Hale. Hale looked round for a site for a new telescope. He selected Mount Wilson in California, which was high, and where the seeing conditions were expected to be, and are, extremely good. There he set up first a 60-inch reflector, and then, in 1917, this one, the 100-inch reflector, which was then the largest telescope in the world, and was, for many years, in a class of its own. And one man who used it to great advantage was Edwin Hubble. Hubble was specially interested in the dim patches called nebulae, and these appeared to be of two types. Some, such as the Sword of Orion, looked like, and actually are, patches of dust and gas. Other 
Lord Ross's pearls seem to be starry. And Hubble wondered whether these starry nebulae might be external galaxies far beyond our own. So he used the Hubble Inch to study certain curious stars known as Cepheid variables. Now these variables give away their real luminosities by the way in which they behave. And of course, as soon as the luminosity is known, the distance can be found. Hubble used the great power of the 100 inch to study Cepheids in spirals, such as the Andromeda spiral, and found they were so far away they could not possibly be members of our own galaxy. And today, we know that the Andromeda spiral is more than two million light years away. Later, Hubble used the 100 inch to show that the entire universe is expanding, and all the groups of galaxies are racing away from each other. And so, the 100 inch very quickly proved its worth. It was right in the forefront of astronomical research, and it has remained there. It was built in a very fine way. Uh, the uh, old drives and electrical system are still working, although we've computerized it and uh, replaced them with new equipment. But the old is still there, ready to be used at any time. The Mount Wilson reflector has a 100-inch mirror, and there are now telescopes bigger than that. How does the 100-inch compare with the real giants of today? It, it can see out as far to uh, detect very faint objects because it doesn't have the collecting area. Uh, but its uh, location uh, in a site which has terrific seeing uh, gives it a special position and the adaptive optics that we've installed gives it an ability to make sharp images that are superior to those of any other telescope regardless of size. This is an extraordinary technology which was developed by the military, although it was suggested by an astronomer at uh, actually Mount Wilson uh, some uh, 50 years ago. And it works by uh, taking a crooked beam of light, which has been mixed up and uh, blurred by the turbulence of the atmosphere. This crooked beam of light uh, uh, hits a mirror whose surface has the ability to be distorted out of shape in such a way that the crooked beam of light hits the crooked mirror and a straight light beam bounces out. And that can be done 300 times a second. It is really a miracle of technology and it has put Mount Wilson back on the cutting edge of astronomy. So Mount Wilson has a great future as well as a great past. But Hale still wasn't satisfied. He planned a telescope twice the size to be set up on another mountain in California, Palomar. Sadly, Hale died before the new telescope was ready. The 200-inch telescope saw first light in 1948. For many years, it remained the world's largest telescope. It was used to extend our range of observation. It gave superb views of objects far out in space, thousands of millions of light years away. In 1952, Walter Bader used it to show that the universe is twice as large as Hubble believed. And this was possible only because of the immense light grasp of the 200 inch. Even so, it had one marked limitation. It couldn't cover the whole of the sky. For many years, astronomy was northern hemisphere based. But from here at the Cape, headquarters of the South African Astronomical Observatories, many of the most interesting objects in the sky can be seen. The clouds of Magellan, the Southern Cross with the coal sack, the globular clusters Omega Centauri and 47 Tucani, the richest part of the Milky Way, and many more. In fact, the first really comprehensive survey of the far southern sky was carried out from the Cape in the 1830s by Sir John Herschel, son of Sir William. And this model of the 20-foot reflecting telescope he brought with him was made by Simon Dwyer, a pupil of the Grove Primary School in Cape Town. And here, at the school, this obelisk marks the site where this great telescope once stood. Herschel was a remarkable man. He uh, was the first person and probably the only astronomer who actually surveyed the entire southern sky uh, with a major telescope. And because he came to the Cape in, for four years, from 1834 to 1838, and during that time, he surveyed the whole of the Southern Hemisphere and produced a catalogue of double stars, nebulae, and lots of single stars as well. What work is carried out here at the Cape itself? Part of the main work that goes on here is the actual construction of modern instruments for the large telescopes that we run. It's a lovely setting here beneath Table Mountain. But what about the seeing conditions? Cape seeing is a infamous, if I may say so. Uh, really, uh, it's very seldom you get seeing that's extremely good. And uh, on many nights here with the city and that, it's extremely turbulent atmosphere and a, a very blurred picture. It was clearly sensible to transfer South Africa's best telescopes to the best site. 
But one big telescope wasn't moved, the Innes 27-inch refractor, set up in 1926 and used for very important measurements of double stars and stellar parallaxes, and many other branches as well. In fact, I very often used it myself. But it doesn't really fit into modern professional programs, and so it was left here. A few years ago, it was temporarily mothballed and the dome used for social functions. But I'm glad to say that after representations by various people, including me, the situation was restored and the telescope is now back with the astronomers and fully operative again. But most of the other big telescopes have now been set up at Sutherland in Cape Province. Sutherland was chosen from a number of sites in South Africa as being the best available. It has a high percentage of clear nights, it's well away from any population centres, it has some of the darkest skies in the world. And in addition, it has an interesting distribution of clear nights, that really the, the probability of a clear night is evenly distributed throughout the year, there's no preferred season. What's the main equipment here? The main equipment consists of four telescopes. We have the largest one is a 1.9 metre telescope, and down to a 0.5 metre. And these are instrumented with photometers, um, spectrographs and cameras. We have both optical and infrared equipment. In addition, we have a solar oscillation telescope. It's one of a network of six around the world, which is run by the University of Birmingham. And of course, whereas, whereas all the other telescopes uh, shut during the day and are open at night, this telescope shuts during the night and is open during the day. What future developments are planned here? The main one is a project to construct a, a four-meter class telescope. This, we call this SALT, stands for Southern African Large Telescope, and we think that South Africa cannot go it on its own in terms of the cost. It has to be in a collaboration with some other country, some international collaboration, and we believe that this telescope would be essential for South Africa to remain competitive into the 21st century. Astronomy was progressing in Australia too. One of the first major observatories was at Mount Stromlo, near Canberra famous for, among other things, the Great Melbourne Reflector, built in the late 1860s and which had a 50-inch metal mirror. Astronomy is always at the forefront of uh, technology and limited by technology. And the forefront of technology at that time was metal mirrors. It's often said that the telescope in its original form was unsuccessful. Why was that? Well, metal mirrors have the problem that they expand and uh, contract. Uh, and amongst the problems that um, uh, were noticed with the metal mirror, there were aberration problems. But it's said that on uh, uh, fine nights, uh, it gave good images. Uh, of course, um, uh, fine nights were defined as those with uh, good images. Mount Stromlo's closeness to Canberra made it necessary to find a better site. Well, there are no high mountains in Australia, but conditions here at Siding Spring are pretty good. There are no towns close by, and the nearest town of any size, Coonabarabran, isn't very big. The observatory is very accessible. You haven't got to climb a volcano or battle your way across hundreds of miles of desert. This is the dome of the great Anglo-Australian Telescope, or AAT, one of the most efficient and most powerful in the Southern Hemisphere. It's an extremely versatile telescope because we have a very wide range of sophisticated different pieces of equipment for doing different kinds of astronomy. Uh, when it came to this two-degree field, device, we realized the only way to do it, because it's so large, complicated and heavy, it was to build a complete new top end to the telescope. It's got a field of view of two degrees across the sky, and, and that may not sound much, but for a big optical telescope it's a very large field of view, and most large telescopes see only a, a small fraction of a degree. We're equipping it with a very large number of optical fibers, in fact we're aiming for 400 fibers, and so this new device will be about ten times bigger area of the sky and about ten times more objects at once than we've ever been able to do before. Although this telescope uses all the modern devices, it's unusual in that it's still used for old-fashioned photography. But there's nothing old-fashioned in the way that Dr. David Malin goes about it. At the Anglo-Australian Observatory, we've, we've maintained a photographic capability for a variety of reasons. Uh, we can certainly do good science with photography. It's very important that uh, we have the wide field capability. But also we operate the UK Schmidt Telescope which is basically a photographic instrument. And so having a photographic capability in the whole organization is still extremely important to us, especially when we want to study uh, the very large objects that we can see in the south. For instance, we have the Magellanic Clouds here, the most wonderful nearby galaxies. They're perfectly fitted onto a, a UK Schmidt plate, which is 14 inches square. What techniques do you use? Well, I use a, a, a range of techniques. Uh, amongst them uh, is a technique I've devised called photographic amplification. It's a simple contact copying process 
uh, which extracts the faint images from the photographic plate and produces a, a very thin-looking uh, film positive of the plate. But then I can add together large numbers of those thin film derivatives and combine the information to produce much, much deeper images than you, than you can obtain from a single plate alone. Telescopes are becoming more and more versatile. At Cambridge, there's an array of optical telescopes. It's called Coast. What we want to do is to build one huge telescope, perhaps 100 metres in diameter, but clearly you can't do that. And the only way you can do it is to make small telescopes uh, and bring the light from each of them looking at the same star, bring it together and reconstruct an image. And to do that, then we have to have uh, a railway system inside this building uh, which compensates the light paths from each of these four telescopes when they're brought together. And the way that works is that there are small trolleys running on the rails with mirrors on them, and they run up and down, and the light's reflected, and it acts like a, an optical trombone in changing the lengths continuously. And they move at a few millimetres a second when we're looking at a star, and they have to be right there. We have to know where they are to about a thousandth of a millimetre. We've, first of all, shown the technique works and that we've actually been able to make a picture of the star capella, which is a binary star, but with much finer resolution than you normally get with a telescope. It shows the binary moving in its orbit, and you see the movement in quite a short time. As we've seen, it's not merely the size of a telescope that's important. Of equal importance these days are the instruments which astronomers use on them.